You remember we said that prayer is extremely important. Prayer is vital. The Spirit of God says that prayer is the breath of the soul. Let me ask you a question. How many times do people breathe a day? Two minutes in the morning, two minutes in the evening, and 15 seconds before meals. People need to breathe in order to stay alive. Spiritually, unless you pray, you will be dead. You will not stay alive. Now, think about that. We don't know the taste of prayer. But when you start literally talking to God, you have a taste that you never had before. Never before. And God tells you what to do and what not to do. God impresses you. For instance, for instance, I was driving, you may have heard the story, I was driving from Tennessee to Wisconsin, and instead of listening to news that are all bad news and manipulatory, and instead of listening to music that sometimes is just nonsense, my wife and I decided to use the time to pray. And then prayer should never be alone. Through prayer, you talk to God. And through the word, God talks to you. And if prayer is the breath of the soul, as far as I know, people breathe out and then they breathe in. When you pray, you breathe out. When you study the word, you breathe in. Therefore, in Testimonies, volume six, it says that volume six, it says, prayer and study should never be separated. They are like a dialogue. Never be separated. And so when you say, I pray, what you want to say is, I pray and study. They never. And you don't pray and study. You don't breathe long, like 15 minutes out, and then study long, breathe 15 minutes in. You, it's, a, it's a dialogue. So you pray a little, study a little, pray a little, study a little, pray. It's like a dialogue. You say something, and then as a good communicator, as a good friend, you keep quiet and let the other one say something. You understand? So prayer and study go together. And so we were driving and do your praying and then listening to audio, Bible and audio books. And then praying again and then pausing and reflecting on it and talking about it and then listening again and then praying a little about it and then listening and then talking about it. So you, you know, you get as much as possible. And so as you are doing that in the listening part, God spoke to me. And I could sense very clear in my mind when God said, if you keep listening, not only when you pray, but throughout the day, I can communicate with you. How do you keep listening through the day? We'll get there. This is really important. And so I kept listening. And I thought I will hear a voice, you know, Pavel, take a left. I didn't hear a voice. Pavel, stop at Olive Garden. I wish he said that, but he didn't. <laughs> stop at Pizza Hut. He didn't say that either. But my telephone started to ring. And when my telephone started to ring, I looked to the phone, and my wife says, who is calling? And I told her who is calling. And she says, do not answer the phone. It's one of our good friends, good men, really good, kind-hearted. And he has a problem as I have a problem. We both have the same problem. We talk too much. <laughs> when the two of us meet, we never get to sleep because we talk until we die. Basically, <laughs> we can talk forever and ever for eternity. Amen. Like that joke, two ladies were in prison for 25 years. And when they were freed, they stayed three more days in front of the prison outside because they didn't finish talking. 20, <laughs> 25 years, you know. So my friend and I, when we meet, we can talk. The previous time when we met, we talked until 3 a.m., until we were falling asleep, and we were still talking. So when my wife sees who calls, she says, do not answer for the rest of six hours until we get back home. You are going to be on the phone. And I said, honey, what if God put him to call? We just prayed, and we said, if you have something for us, tell us. And after we finish praying, God, here we are listening. The telephone rings. What if? She says, nah, cannot be God. I said, okay. So I didn't answer the phone. And here I am. I am praying again. Lord, please, if you have me, do something today. Here I am. Use me today. And the phone rings again. The same guy. 
And I tell my wife, hey, what if God asks you to call? I says, okay, answer, but don't stay more than two hours. <laughs> Imagine. And so I answer the phone. And he says, hey, man, how are you doing? I said, I'm good. I'm driving. I, how are you doing? He says, I'm bad. I said, what happened? You had an accident. No. It has been snowing for three days and three nights. I was driving a Toyota Sienna, all-wheel drive, going through the snow. But there were cars in the ditch, you know. And so he says, I'm going to Cuba in a mission trip. And my car is broken, and the bus didn't come because of the snow. And nobody wants to drive me through the snow to Chicago to catch the plane. And he said, pray for me. So I said to him, very simple, I said, I am driving to your tower right now. How do you explain that on a 12-hour trip from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Wisconsin, 11 hours and a half, when he calls, in that moment, you are actually driving through his town? Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? And I said, what exit are you? And he told me the exit. And I said, I see that as I was talking to him, I approached the exit. He could have called one minute later, you know, pass. And so I, I got on the exit. I, I said, how do you go? He said, take a left. I took a left. He says, how in the world are you here? Are you waiting for my phone call? I said, yeah. He says, no, you are not. How, how can you explain that? I said, well, we are driving. And I was praying that God talks to me if he needs help. So I got to his house. I took him, drove him to the airport instead of going home, dropped him. He had half an hour to board him. He caught the plane. He baptized a bunch of people in Cuba, did evangelism, and so on and so forth. God, when you start to experience God, he talks to you. But that means that you don't pray once in a while, sporadically, when you have a need, a crisis prayer. Oh, we had an accident. Oh, I have an exam. That's when you pray. Or you pray routine. That means that prayer becomes the breath of the soul, that you keep praying, as the Bible says, without ceasing. Basically, that you stay connected. You never disconnect. And so then you have two types of prayer. There are many types of prayer. And we don't have time. The prayer seminar takes about 12 to 15 hours. I have about six hours on the Lord's Prayer, about eight more sermons on different types of eight types of prayer, intercessory prayer, petition prayer, thanksgiving prayer, and so on. And then I have prayer in Jesus' name. How do you pray in Jesus' name? Because people say, you know, whatever you ask in my name, the Bible verse. How do you pray in Jesus' name? And then I have, so basically all of those, we don't have time to go through them. And then what are the Bible promises related to prayer? What are the barriers that limit prayer from being answered? Those are important things. And so we don't have time for that. But I'm going to give you a few things that are absolutely crucial. So you have crisis prayer that people pray when they go to an accident, a tragedy, cancer, divorce, and so on. Okay? You have routine prayer. People pray because they do their duty. It's the right thing to do. So, you know, they pray. They don't even think about it. You have devotional prayer that means your time to know God relationship. And you have pray without ceasing prayer that is not necessarily praying, but rather being aware of God's presence, staying connected. What the Bible says, Abraham walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Moses walked with God. How do you walk with God? And he walks with me, and he, you know. How do you walk with God? In the spirit of prophecy, it says, Enoch walked with God, comma, and then the paragraph says, he was continually aware of God's presence next to him, continually to be aware God is here. Continually depending on God in everything he did, basically you don't do before you ask. Continually aware, continually dependent. Now listen carefully. Continually surrendering. That's big. To continually be aware of God's presence. That means to walk with God. That means that in every second, you get used. Before you do something, you ask God, like Nehemiah, before the king. The king says, what do you want? And the Bible says, before he asked, he said, Lord, what do you want me to ask? If people do that, they will, we'll have a lot of Nehemiahs today. We'll have a lot of Daniels today, and so on. Man, that light is killing me. Anyway, and so, thank you. A little more, just a bit more. Yes, thank you. Whew. I need Q-tips to clean my eyes. <laughs> and so, let's go through it. 
When you go to prayer, the Bible says, enter his gates with healing. Why? Thanks. Yes, absolutely right. Why? Enter his gates with praises. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Why? Hallowed be thy name. Praise him. Why do you enter his gates with thanks? Why? Is it because God is proud? He likes to be flattered. He says, oh, I love it when they say, you are so good. Do, is it because God likes to be flattered? No. I mean, people do that, you know. Presidents and, and politicians and even our bosses sometimes, some of them like to be praised. Okay. That's a crime to praise somebody because what you do, you make them proud. Instead of emphasizing God, you emphasize humans. And so why would God say that we need to come into his presence with praises? Is it because he is worthy? He is worthy, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, angels praise him day and night, you know? They sing hallelujah chorus there, you know, and I believe they don't sing four voices. They sing about 12 voices or whatever, 16 voices. You know, I read somewhere that you can, that, that angels can sing. I'm not sure what I read. Maybe I dreamed two voices in the same time, the same person using both vocal cords. Somehow I, I believe I'm not sure if he's right. This is just me talking, joking. But think, think about it. The heavenly choir, they praise the Lord because he is worthy. Is that the reason Jesus says to praise him because he is worthy? He is worthy, but that's not the reason. Then why praise the Lord when you go into his presence? Not because he wants it, not because he likes to be flattered, not because he is worthy, he deserves it. Uh, then why? <laughs> to humble ourselves, that's a good answer, I like it. Never thought about it, I need to learn, I need to add it to my seminar, thank you. <laughs> but it's not the reason. Listen, the Bible says that when you ask something, believe that you have received it and it's yours. You remember? You need to believe because without faith, the Bible says it is impossible to please God, to work with God because it's all by faith. You don't see it. You don't deserve it. You don't understand it by like forgiveness. Do you see forgiveness? Like, like, like you know, uh, when you go to God and you say, I believe, what do you, what do you feel? Faith. How, how, how do you measure faith? People say, Pastor, I want to believe, but I don't feel it. Well, well faith is not feelings. It's, oh, I feel faith. <laughs> faith is not feeling. So listen, when you go in God's presence, before asking you anything, forgiveness, help, before doing anything, in order for God to answer those requests, you need to believe. Because only by believing, you allow him to work. If you pray, help me with this but you doubt, and then you go ahead and you try to solve it. You never give God a chance to solve it for you. The Bible says, those who wait upon the Lord renew their strength. And that's a big deal. People pray, and then they do it themselves. They never wait. People don't like to wait. I mean, think about this. Abraham prayed for a son. How many years did he have to wait? 25. 25. He was 100. When he got the answer, he started to pray when he was 75. And Sarah was 90. Imagine. <laughs> I'm going to have a son. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting. Answers to prayer in the Bible. If you count the prayers, there are about 700 prayers without the book of Psalm. The book of Psalm itself is only prayers. So without Psalm, all the other books in the Bible have about 700 prayers. 450 of them have recorded answer. That's 69%. However, I believe there are more answered. It was just never recorded. From those 450 that have recorded answer, over 90% of them, the answer, it's a process. It's not an event. You pray now and the answer comes in 13 years like Joseph. You pray now and the answer comes in 40 years like Moses. 120 years like Noah, 25 years like Abraham, a quick one, three weeks, Daniel. The angel says, when you started, not when you finished, when you started to pray, I started to work, but I could not answer because I had to fight the kings of Persians and Medians. And now I can give the answer. But as long as you prayed, I was working. So when you start praying, God starts working, but you don't see an answer. So because you don't see an answer, you say, God is not working. So then what you do, instead of waiting on the Lord, 
you go ahead and do it yourself and you make a mess and you miss the opportunity to experience God's work in your life because you don't trust him. And so because you don't have faith, you don't experience God. If you would keep praying and waiting, you would see a miracle out of this world because God would do for you what he did for Moses who waited, for Abraham who waited, for Joseph, for Daniel, for all of them that trusted God enough to wait and not get involved. When Abraham didn't want to wait for God, he said, you know, I'm going to help God have a baby. And he slept with his servant. You remember? He made a mess. When people don't wait upon the Lord, they make a mess. When people wait upon the Lord and they trust, he's the, he loves me, he heard me, he knows the future, he has the power. So when you don't wait, what, what is the message that you say? Don't, judge. don't trust him. He doesn't love me. He doesn't care. He cannot do it. He's retired. He's in vacation. He is sleeping. He has arthritis. You know? <laughs> people call me. Pastor, I've been praying for six months and God doesn't answer. And I tell them, you know, God doesn't like you. They say, what? I say, God doesn't like you. No, he likes me. Okay, are you sure? Yes. So you sure that he likes you? Yes. You sure that he loves you? Yes. Then I tell you what's the reason. He doesn't, if you are sure that he loves you, it means he lost his power. When they cut his hair, he lost his power. <laughs> and they say, no, 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 God has power. Oh, so he loves you, he has power. Yeah, probably he doesn't have the wisdom. He doesn't know how to answer. Oh, no, no, he has wisdom. So you tell me that God loves you. He has the power to answer. He has the wisdom to answer. Then why doesn't he answer? And they say, I don't know. I, I said, well, it's not a problem with God. It's a problem with you. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So you need faith to be able to stand back when you don't understand and don't have a solution. And let him work. Let God be God. And as you wait upon him, you give him a chance to put things together in ways that you don't even think because you don't know the future, you don't know anything. You really don't know anything. That's the reason. When you come into his presence, instead of focusing on your problems, what you want to ask, you first need to focus on God because that will develop faith. So then you can ask and trust. So praising him is not helping God. It's actually building faith for you. Because if you spend time thinking and talking about your problems, the more you do that, the bigger the problems seem to be. The more depressed you are, the more discouraged, the less faith. But instead of focusing on the problems, if you take your eyes off your problems, off your challenges, off your crisis, off your sins, and you put your eyes on God, and you start talking about him, you are a wonderful God. Oh, man, you have done this and that and that for me in the past. When I, Because you did have crisis before. This is not the first crisis, and it's not the last. I remember the last crisis, Lord, how you were for me. It was amazing. I didn't have a solution, and you did it. And then you promised this and that. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I've inscribed you on my palms. You love me so much. You promised that I will never be alone. You promised if I go to waters, you'll be with me. When I go through the fire, you'll be with me. Lord, you don't lie. Your, your promise, you died for me. You love me so much. When you start focusing on God, who he is, how much he loved you, what he has done for you in the past, and so on and so forth, the more you talk about God, the more you fix your eyes on God, the more you understand that, hey, you can trust him. The more you understand how much he loves you, how powerful he is, how much he wants to help you. And then whatever you talk about is what influences your mind. It's like you have two flowers. Whatever flower you water and feed, that's going to grow. So if you reinforce and feed and nurture faith, your faith is going to grow. But if you talk about problems, then your faith is going to fiddle and die. So God wants you, when you go in his presence, instead of focusing on problems, to focus on him until you realize that he loves you. And then that builds faith. And when you have faith, then you can go and ask. Does it make any sense? Mm -hmm. That's the reason you look in the Bible. Jehoshaphat, the Syrian army attacks him. Big army. And he has little army and no weapons and nothing. And he goes with a letter from Sanherib or whatever is the name in English. I don't know. He goes with the letter in the temple and he says, Lord, please, please, we have a problem. We are attacked. Please help us. It's a big army. What am I going to do? I don't have a... Instead of really getting depressed, he says, Lord, you are such a wonderful God. You have been with us in the past. You delivered us from Egypt. You split the sea. You gave us Canaan. You gave us bread from heaven, manna. You gave us water from the rock. You... And he goes to the past, what God has done for them in the past. Why? 
Why would you have to remind God? Because God has a short, he got Alzheimer's. He has a short memory. You need to remember. God will remember. Oh, I don't. Why would Jehoshaphat tell God what God has done in the past? Is it because God lost his memory? Or because he himself needed to remember what God has done in the past? That's what the Bible says, Psalm 103. It says, bless the Lord of my soul and do not forget any of his benefits. That's what Moses told Israel in Deuteronomy. Write all these things on something and then read them to your children and grandchildren daily. Because as they read what God has done in the past, it gives them strength and faith for the present. That's what the Spirit of God says. We have nothing to fear unless we forget how God has led us in the past. You follow me? So when you go in God's presence, instead of asking, you start praising because that helps you process. You talk to God. And he loves you and he has helped you in the past and he promised to be with you. And as you focus on those things, it helps you realize what a God you have and it develops faith and it strengthens you. It reminds you that you can trust in him and that helps you. Remembering the past, remembering the promises, focusing on God's character, it gives you strength for the present crisis that you can say, you know what? He has helped me in the past. I'm going to trust him in the present. That's the reason you enter his presence with thanksgiving. 